This weekend, we're starting a brand new message series called Men and Women in a Ken and Barbie World. So I decided to ask some Eagle Brook staff couples about their partners. Let's see how they did. Does she still have her wisdom teeth? I think so. Yes. No. no. Does he have his wisdom teeth? No. Yeah, that's correct. Name one thing she got you for Christmas. <laughs> What's John's favorite movie? Uh, uh, the Natural. Incorrect. Let me try again. Bull Durham. Not even top five. What's her biggest pet peeve? Me, when I constantly clear my throat. Very true. What are your kids' teachers' names? Miss... Miss... Who is their teacher? Mrs. Harding. Yes. What's John's favorite food? Uh... Uh, it's, it's, um, enchiladas? No. What's her favorite movie? Favorite movie is Legally Blonde. <laughs> What's his favorite movie? Man from Snow River. Absolutely correct. Tell me about your first date. Probably, like, our first date, uh, Boston's. Our first date was church. What's his favorite movie? Braveheart. Yeah. <laughs> What's her favorite movie? Braveheart. What's her favorite food? Sushi. Tacos. What's her favorite food? I'm gonna say mac and cheese. No. Uh, what's her love language? <laughs> Physical touch. <laughs> that was wishful thinking. <laughs> The end of that video gets me every single time. Welcome to church. Friends, if you are here at the Lionel campus, I want to welcome you. Uh, it is great to have you. And if you are watching online, listening online, wherever you might be, glad that you're a part of this. My name is Jeremy, and I am going to do my best today. In fact, I'm going to speak on behalf of the band. We are going to do our best today in leading you in songs that glorify the name of Jesus. That is our goal, friends. So I want to invite you to stand on up. And let's do it. Let's sing together and lift high, glorify the name of Jesus. Here we go. Chaos. Hey, awesome. 
Future is 
Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for what you are doing in this place, God, for what you've done for us, what you did last week, what you continue to do today, Lord, how you are present in every season of our life. God, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've been through, Jesus, you never leave us or forsake us, God, that if we call upon you, Lord, you will draw near to us. So Jesus, would you help us today to lean into you, to go towards you like never before, God. Jesus, we need your hope. We need you as our future. So Jesus, we give you our worship. We give you our praise and our attention now. We pray all this in your powerful name. Amen. Church, thanks for singing with us. You can go ahead and take a seat. Hey, what's up, everyone? And thanks for joining us for Eagle Brook Online. My name is Jeff Dodge. I'm the online campus pastor. And last weekend was incredible. We did our winter baptism at all of our campuses, including a handful of online attenders that traveled to be here. In total, we baptized 1,064 people. Now, if you're like me, I just need a second to take that in. That is 1,064 people with unique stories and experiences whose lives will never be the same. Each of them have family and friends, and we just simply can't measure the impact of that many people making this decision. And if you're one of those people, I just wanna say, way to go. And if you watched online, we tried to capture and show you the full scope of what was happening. 12 campuses giving people the opportunity to declare their faith in God by getting baptized. It's hard to describe the feeling of watching person after person experience this defining moment in their life the point where they go public with their new identity as a follower of Jesus. I found myself tearing up watching individuals and watching couples and siblings and friends link arms and take this step of obedience to the roar of their church cheering them on. Now for online, We've noticed over the years that not many people love the idea of coming to Minnesota in the winter, but kudos to the one online attender who flew from Florida to get baptized last weekend. But we wanna let you know that we already have our summer baptism registration open, which is in July. And we wanna give you as much heads up as possible because we know many of you will need to make travel plans to be here. And if you watched last weekend and it sparked something in you, it would be our honor to baptize you this summer. For all the details and to let us know you're coming, you can head over to eaglebrookchurch.com slash baptism. But with that, Ryan has the message today as we kick off a new series. I hope you enjoy the rest of the service. What's going on, everybody? My name is Ryan, and it's such a pleasure to be with you this weekend. Before we dive into today's message, two weeks ago, we encouraged the church to give above and beyond to support 24 local and global partner organizations that are making a difference all around the world. And I want you to know that every dollar given for that one week will go outside the walls of this church. And I get the honor and privilege of announcing that this church showed up in such an incredible way and gave $2,640,756.07. But that's not it. Each year, the Eagle Brook Foundation makes a contribution as well. And so this year, added to that amount, 
the Eagle Brook Church Foundation gave another $860,068.94, giving us a total of $3,500,825 and one cent, okay? Let's not forget the one cent, it matters. And I love the one cent because sometimes people can think that their giving doesn't matter. I just want you to know every cent can make a difference in this world. Now, today we're kicking off a brand new series called Men and Women in a Ken and Barbie World. It's an interesting world that you and I are living in, where there are so many conversations going on right now about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. And there's a lot of sources that we could turn to to get insights on what that means. But I want to encourage us over the next few weeks to begin to take our cues from God's word on this subject. I know a lot of people are trying to figure out who they are, but the best way to figure that out is to turn to their creator. This first weekend, I'd love for us to be able to come to a biblical understanding of answering this question. What is beauty? Like when we really talk about someone that is truly beautiful, someone that is truly attractive, what does that look like from a biblical standpoint? Because When you and I find ourselves living in a Ken and Barbie world, it's like, is that perfect image what we're supposed to look like? Now, I'll be honest, just at the top of the message, okay, I have never felt an ounce of pressure to look like Ken. I'm going to just throw that out there right now. (laughs) Never felt any Ken pressure in my life. However, I have felt a lot of pressure to look like Dwayne Johnson. Okay, I got a lot of Dwayne pressure in my life, okay? Now, I saw this dude doing an interview on YouTube the other day, and I thought, look at this guy. This guy just looks amazing. You know what I need to do? I need to buy some of those muscle-enhancing polos, you know, get the gun show started, right? And so I hop online, and I'm finding these muscle polos, right? And I order them, and and apparently muscles are sold separately, okay? Like, they don't come... (laughs) with the shirt, okay? On Dwayne, they're muscle shirts. On Ryan, they're just shirts. Uh, and another season of my life, you know, I had some, some men that were just like, man, you're a man's man, you gotta, you gotta have the right watch, man. Like, when you gonna get you a Rolex, Ryan? I'm like, a Rolex, man? I'll get one when it starts tracking my sleep and workouts like my Apple Watch. Like, dude, I'm good. And, and then I got some other friends that are like real men's men. They grunt every time they see me. I'm like, hey, man, chill. Like, I'm just, I'm just trying to say hi. But they're like men's men. Like, sometimes I'm just like, I'm a city guy. Like, let's just go out to eat. Let's go get something to eat. Like, you trying to get something to eat? They're like, yeah, we got to stop by Cabela's first and gear up, okay? <laughs> they're buying camouflage, onesies, GPS units, first aid kits, game bags. I'm like, what do we do? And they're like, we can only eat what we kill. I'm like, I thought we was going to Chili's. Like, I don't know how we got to Cabela's. They ain't got no Nikes here. Like, what, like what's, what's happening? Now, I, I think that that's... That's minor pressure for me as as a man. But for women, it's a whole different ball game. Um, I had my wife's phone the other day, and I was on Instagram on her phone. And I was like, why does Instagram look different on your phone than it looks on my phone? It looked like two completely different planets. Because on my Instagram, all I see is shoes and basketball highlights. She's an interior designer, so her feed is all everything, makeup, hair, nails, HGTV, home decor, DIY, anything you can possibly imagine, and approximately one million get ready with me videos. I don't know if you've seen these get ready with me videos. It's someone, they put their camera, they post it up on their bathroom sink, and you get ready with them, and you get ready with them to go on a date, to work, to church, to the gym, get ready with me to take my kids to school. I'm just like, if people are watching you, they're actually not getting ready. And so, (laughs) but I'm just like looking at her world and I'm like, is this the pressure you feel every day to look like all of this stuff and for our home to look like all of this stuff? And, And I think, in my opinion, the woman world is ruled by one word, cute. The beauty standard you're supposed to live up to 
is cute in every way. And Target is preying on your cute standard, and they are winning. <laughs> My wife got a new soap tray the other day for our shower. We are the only people that see this soap tray, by the way. I said, why do we get this new soap tray? Because it's cute. <laughs> Food doesn't just have to be good. It's got to be plated, cute. A cup of coffee, it's got to have like a little leaf with cream. It's got to be cute. House doesn't have to just be clean. It must be cute. You don't have to just work out. You have to look cute while doing it. And oh, by the way, your kids got to be cute. Their pajamas got to be cute. Just in case your followers stop by your house at 830 at night. Now, I'm not knocking cute. My wife's cute. I like her. I'm not knocking Cabela's, watches, or having a six-pack. But I think as men and women, when it comes to beauty, if you and I aren't careful, we may simply strive to become what we think somebody else wants us to look like and be like. Instead of being what God is calling us to look like and become. And isn't it exhausting trying to live up to everybody else's standard of beauty? I think that's why it's vitally important that we come to an understanding of God's standard of what makes someone truly beautiful. I think the first step is truly us being able to grasp what God's definition of beauty really is. And to do that, I think we have to begin to value what God values. Um, there is this guy in the Old Testament named Saul. Now, he's infamously known as the guy who spent way too much of his life and reign chasing a guy named David. Now, here's what's interesting about King Saul. 1 Samuel 9 says this about him. It says, there was a wealthy, influential man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. His son Saul, watch this, was the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. Here's the deal, my friends. Uh, I don't know how good you may or may not think you look, but this is next level. Perhaps there are men in the world who have been voted sexiest man alive, but that was from a magazine. My friends, the Bible is calling this dude the most handsome man in Israel. You ain't never seen nobody look this good, okay? Like, you might think your little boyfriend or husband is cute, but is he biblically handsome? I don't think so. Like, there are levels to this thing. And oh... By the way, he taller than everybody too. So not only is he handsome in biblical proportion, but everywhere he goes, everyone can see just how good looking he is. However, seven chapters later in his life, we see this. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. At this point in Saul's career, he had made some pretty selfish decisions that in God's view deemed him unfit to be the leader of his people. And so God warns Samuel and says, don't be distracted by his outward appearance because I can see something that you can't see. You see, God values different things than what we often value. He values the qualities of the heart like integrity, being a person of your word. God values qualities like faith. In fact, in Matthew Chapter 8, we see Jesus approached by a captain in the military asking for Jesus to heal one of his servants. Jesus replied, should I come and heal him? In other words, Jesus says, hey, what time do you want me to come over? And the military captain says, hey, Jesus, I don't even deserve to have you in my house. Just say the word 
and I believe he will be healed. Hey, Jesus, I think your words have the ability to travel to my house, even if you don't come there yourself. And then Matthew 8, 10 says this. It says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Now, we can read about Saul's appearance, and the Bible is clear. This brother got it going on, okay? He's a good-looking guy. However, God isn't impressed. Do you know how hard it is to impress God? Do you know how hard it is to impress Jesus? The Scripture says that Jesus was amazed twice in Scripture, and one is this scenario. When a man had faith that went beyond anything Jesus had ever seen. Can I submit something to you? Faith looks good on you. There's a lot of things that you and I can find attractive. But how attractive is somebody that has just a little bit of crazy faith? Whether you're single, engaged, divorced, married, widowed. At some point when we're trying to engage with someone we're sitting across from, there are so many things we could talk about to connect. The weather, politics, kids, logistics of a household. But here's what I would encourage us all to do. I'd encourage us all to begin to have an intentional conversation Dare I say a faith conversation. Imagine if on your next date night, if you both were to just share one crazy faith prayer. A crazy faith prayer for healing. A crazy faith prayer for a family member to give their life to Jesus that would be considered the last person in your family to do something like that. Imagine if you said, hey, here's... The thing I'm asking God for that I would be nervous to tell someone else out loud, but you know what? I believe that my God is able to do it. You know, these songs that we sing at church, they're not just good lyrics and melodies. I'm believing that the miracle work in God we sing about might just deliver one to our family. That's beautiful. And it has nothing to do with our outer appearance. Now, if you find yourself here today and you're an extremely good looking person and people have compared you to Ken or Barbie at a time in your life, I'm not insinuating that looking good is bad, but I am asking all of us, regardless of where we stand on the good looking scale, how much do we really value what people can see on the outside? versus what God can see on the inside. How much do we value the matters of the heart? If we were able to evaluate our hearts this weekend, what would be there? Bitterness? Grudges? Selfishness? Anger? Pride? FYI, I don't care how good looking you are. When we have those things in our hearts, it's not a good look on anybody. So I got to ask you today, how's your heart? How's your heart today? I think this is important because I believe when we value what God values, we secondly begin to look for what God looks for. What I found to be true is that men and women, what they typically look for in each other isn't always bad but it's often misaligned with what God looks for. I mean, most people are looking for the most attractive, perhaps wealthy, this is is sometimes preferred, and somebody that has a personality that meshes best with theirs. And if they're a Christian, it'd be great if they go to church and sometimes listen to Elevation Worship in their free time. But the number one question that I've gotten from singles is, uh, hey, Ryan, do you believe that You need to be attracted to the person you're with, which is a uh, complicated question, which I will respond to with a complicated answer. 
So we're not talking Bible right now. Okay, this is just my own personal opinion, just for a moment. I'm going to go with yes and no. Okay, now follow me for just a second. Yes, in my own opinion, I think it would be helpful if you were attracted to the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with. However, the no piece is that I think what we often find attractive is just extremely flawed. And I'm not saying you shouldn't be picky. You should definitely choose wisely when it comes to romantic relationships. However, having been married for just over a decade now, and obviously we've got thousands of married people among us today, the math I've seen is that what we look for to get into a relationship aren't the things that actually sustain us in the relationship or in the marriage. I had a guy come to me a couple weeks ago. He said, Ryan, I found the perfect girl. I said, perfect? Is her name Eve? This is crazy. I got to meet her. (laughs) I said, Ryan, she's incredible. Loves Jesus, woman of God, has an incredible family. She's about to graduate with a law degree. My mom loves her, and my mama don't like nobody. Dude, this is nuts. I was like, wow. Like, man, this, this sounds like a winner, winner, chicken dinner. This is amazing. And then he says, but, uh, Ryan, it's just, well, she's got red hair. I can't do redheads, bro. I can't do redheads. I was like, What? You can't do redheads. What you got against redheads? Did you know Jason Strand is a redhead? Good thing he married already. But I'm like, my goodness, what's up with redheads? I said, brother, let me get this straight. This person checks a lot of the boxes you have. But your only issue with her is her hair. He said, yep, can't do it. I said, I did. And I just realized people have all sorts of deal breakers. And they're often physical. He's perfect, but he's too short, and I like wearing heels. I'm like, did you say perfect? You used perfect. I didn't say he's perfect. You said he was perfect. I'm just, and, and I just, I looked at my friend who's, who's got this deal with redheads, and I just said, hey, man, can I, can, I just, can I just challenge you on something today? He said, man, whatever you got to say, man, come on, speak to me, man. I'm trying to process this thing. I said, all right, I'm just, I'm just going to do some math for you, okay? I'm, I'm going to do some math for you. Um, let me just tell you what I know to be true about every married person in the whole world world. There is not one currently married person that has ever in their life said the following. My spouse is emotionally distant, spiritually bankrupt, and completely disengaged with our family, but they do have blonde hair. Nobody says that. (laughs) No one has, doesn't matter if you're a Christian or no one has ever said that, ever, ever. Nobody said they cheated on me, but at least they're hot. You know, that's great. (laughs) It's not that looks don't matter or that we shouldn't look for someone attractive because I most certainly did. But my concern is that outer beauty is playing such a large role in how people get into relationships and such a small role in how people stay in relationships. And I just think we have to do better math in this area. Whenever I'm single guy friends come to me to discuss a potential girlfriend, um, they always want to show me the picture first. They're like, hey, Ryan, look. I'm like, cool, man. That, that's great. And they're like, well, what do you think? I'm like, well, I'm married, so I don't know what, what my options are right now. <laughs> like, what am, I, what am I supposed to say? Like, they're photogenic. Uh, they're Invisalign worked. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they're the one. I care to share anything besides their profile pic. Like what I'm trying to figure out is from their favorite photo of them, what makes them suited to be a candidate for you to make a sacred covenant with them for life. I mean, I just read a stat once that from a schedule and time standpoint, couples will spend 0.2% of their marriage having sex. 0.2. I can see a lot of you doing math right now. You're like, you think we're 0.2 or 0.3? Where are we? That's between y'all. But I just promise you, the rest of your marriage, you want to know what you're going to be doing? Cleaning. (laughs) Netflix, okay? Homework, cooking, planning, budgeting, sports, playing it, 
watching it, taking little humans all over the Twin Cities to learn it. And then once you're done with all that, you're going to be doing more cleaning, okay? Like that's what, what's actually going to be the schedule of your marriage. What I want you to understand is that for the other 99.8% of a lifelong commitment, if I were you, I'd be looking for what God looks for because you're going to need it. I promise you. And if you don't believe me, ask some married people. Just talk to them for a second and go, do you think he's telling you? He's just like, yeah, you're going to need a little bit more than a six-pack. I promise you for this thing to work. If I'm you, I'm looking for somebody that's got sustainable character, integrity, and faith. I think we even get more insight into this in, in 1 Peter. It, it says this. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather... It should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. I know there has been much debate about this verse, and perhaps in some conversations, it's actually been leveraged against women. But I'd love to give us some context to this scripture. You see, the teaching about submission was especially relevant to a first century married woman who had just begun to follow Jesus. For them, they were wondering what following Jesus meant for their marriage. And in the culture of the ancient world, it was almost unthinkable for a wife to adopt a different religion than her husband. And so Christian women who started following Jesus before their husbands started following Jesus needed some instruction. You see, they would have questions like, should I leave my husband? Should I change my behavior towards him? Should I assume a superior position to him because I'm following Jesus and he isn't? In that context, I actually think this teaching is brilliant. Peter's going, hey, listen, if you really want to win your husband, if you really want him to follow Jesus, talking him into it isn't a great plan. Peter's going, how about this show before you tell? I mean, you just think about what you've tried to get your husband to do with your words. Peter's going, what would you do if I told you? That you'd gain more relational equity with him through gentle and loving actions than verbal arm twisting. The part where Peter addresses hairstyles and jewelry, context here is that in the world Peter lived in, women often arranged and dyed their hair. They also wore wigs. Peter did not forbid women from fixing their hair or wearing jewelry. But he more points to the real beauty that doesn't come from what you put on. It comes from what has been put in. It comes from being the person God has called you to be in your heart. And I think it's the same for men. Because I think we all can find ourselves going to many lengths in an effort to upgrade and upkeep our outer appearance. But the real challenge is that we will often do very little for our souls. I want you to consider the amount of resources you have leveraged for things on the outside. And then begin to ask yourself, what, have I, what resources have I leveraged for the condition of my family's soul? What have we done to cultivate the things in us and in our heart to be what God would consider truly beautiful? 
Which brings me to my last point that I want us all to consider when we value what God values and begin to look for what God looks for. I believe that we can then begin to nurture what God nurtures. I think when we value what God values, we begin to get a new definition of beauty. I think when we look for what God looks for, I believe our relationships with others are significantly impacted because we're operating with a completely different standard. This is about how we see each other and what we look for in each other. However, when we attempt to nurture what God nurtures, it's about actually looking for ways to cultivate inner beauty. And there's a passage in scripture that I believe can help us see the things that God nurtures. It's found in Galatians chapter five. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. This is the list of things and qualities that the Spirit of God produces. And I want us to look at this list together. Now, when we look at this list, I think it would be easy to sit back and go, it'd be awesome to be married to that. It'd be awesome to work for that. It'd be awesome to work with that. Man, I wish my neighbor was that. I wish the school principal would be more like that. I wish my teacher, I wish my lawyer, I wish my doctor would have a little bit more. Like, like it's easy to look at the list and go, wouldn't it be great if we had that? But today I want you to consider, wouldn't it be great if we were that? I mean, let's just look at the list. When we start with love, how well are you doing it? Nurturing Love. I think for me, sometimes in my mind, the way that I show love is through presence. I like buying people gifts, but sometimes the way people need love from me the most is through presence, not presence. Being really in the room. Sometimes they don't want the gift I bought them. Sometimes they want the gift of my time. And if I'm honest, it's probably the area I'm weakest in. What's next? Joy. How well are you doing at cultivating joy? Have you woken up a day in your life and perhaps thought that your joy was someone else's responsibility? I can only imagine what it would look like for you and I to cultivate joy, the kind of joy that is found in a relationship with God, the kind of joy that comes from a perspective that only God can bring that produces so much inner joy, that you bring that to a relationship instead of stepping into the relationship, hoping that the relationship will produce joy when you could have brought it to the party? What about peace? When I consider what it means to nurture inner peace, I actually think about protecting it. I see it as turning on do not disturb for our souls, because isn't it amazing how easily disturbed we can become from one email, from one headline, from one post. You, you wonder what I think would be a remarkable prayer, absolutely beautiful prayer that we all could pray in 2024. Lord, help me nurture and cultivate peace in all of my relationships. Help me nurture and cultivate peace in all of my conversations. Because can't we easily get caught up in divisive conversations and just lose our peace. How beautiful is the person that keeps peace? Sometimes you got to play mediators. Hey, y'all, calm down, calm down. Like, like when you have that, that's beautiful. How beautiful is the person that brings peace? Because you got people in your life that bring anxiety everywhere they go. They just bring it to every party they walk into. They bring it to every meeting. And then you got those people in your life, they bring peace. When they walk in the room, you go, "Ah, I'm so glad you're here. You feel like when they're in the room, everything is going to be all right. Why wouldn't we want to be that kind of person? What's next? Patience. I don't like talking about patience. 
because oftentimes I feel like I have none. But it's something that I'm praying to the Lord to say, would you help me cultivate this? I need it for traffic. I need it for the airport. <laughs> I need it for my nine-year-old and four-year-old who are at a season of their life where they have a hundred questions per day and it's nonstop and sometimes they're repeated and so it's not just Q&A time. Now it's an FAQ. This is a frequently asked question. You keep asking the same questions over and over again. And sometimes I just need a break from your questions, okay? I don't have time for an interview today. Like I feel like we're on a podcast. In fact, we call our four-year-old podcast because he never stops talking. And so I'm just like, can we just record this guy? He's going to need this later. And it's just questions, 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 questions. And it's like sometimes I just lose my patience. And, and um, I, this weekend, I, I flew up here from Dallas and I brought my nine-year-old with me and he's asking questions all through TSA pre-check. And he's asking questions on the plane about Minnesota. And is it, there going to be snow there? Of course, there's going to be snow there. And so we're just going through all the questions, questions, questions. And then we get to the car rental and I'm giving the lady uh, my, my license and my credit card to rent the car. And he's just asking more and more questions and I just turned around and I said, would you be quiet for a second? My goodness. And the lady looks at me and she goes, do you speak at Eagle Brook Church? I was like, no, no, me? No. Who is this person you're, you, you've, you've seen? Do I look like him? Like, does he have a doppelganger? I'm like, sounds like a great guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, it's like, Ryan, chill out, dude. Have a little patience. You know what the word patience really means? It's, it's connected to forbearance. It's this idea of I'm going to withhold uh, collecting a debt for a later time. I'll be patient. It's actually connected to forgiveness. To say, you know what? Why don't I withhold judgment and let this story play out a little bit? Before I come to collect the debt. In fact, what if I had so much patience? I would actually release the debt. You want to know what really looks good on you? Forgiveness. Show me a forgiving person. You're showing me a beautiful person. What else is on the list? Kindness. I've discovered that we all live in a pretty mean world. I was uh, walking into an event the other day with an event planner who met me outside and we walk into the building and there was this janitor uh, kind of in our way. And I just, I said, what's up to him? I said, what's up, man? You good? How's life? And me and the janitor literally talked for about seven to 10 seconds. And the event planner grabbed me. She said, hey, can we talk? I said, oh no, what did I do? Is everything okay? She goes, no, I just, I just want to chat. I just want to chat with you for a little bit. I said, I said, well, what's going on? She goes, well, Ryan, I got to be honest with you. Our team thought you would be more of a diva. I said, yeah, why, 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 did you, why did you think that? She said, well, we just figured most speakers like you have this rider and you want green M&Ms. And I was like, I'm more of a Starburst guy, but that's whatever, you know, pink Starburst. Pink Starburst is my jam, but I didn't ask for that. And so I'm like, so when did you, I'm not offended, when did you figure out that I wasn't a diva, like what changed your mind? No, by the way, I can still make some requests, so this, this is not a done deal yet, but I'm just curious where we're at in the relationship. And she said, well, what changed my mind is you were so kind to the janitor. I said, that was kind. Kind in my mind would have been buying him lunch. Asking him how he's doing seemed like the human thing to do when someone's in front of you. You know what I learned in that moment? You only have to be a little kind to make a big difference in the world that you and I live in. And it's beautiful when we do it. Whether you're looking at goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, I want you to look at the whole list. This week with your family, maybe with a small group, Maybe over a cute cup of coffee with a good friend. And begin to discuss what it would look like for you to really begin to nurture the fruit of the spirit in your life. I think you and I can easily pull our standard of beauty 
from our televisions, from computers, or the many applications on our cell phones. But I wonder who's here today that is really at a crossroads in their life of trying to figure out who they are. And I think over the next couple of weeks, God's really going to reveal your purpose. And that God can truly show you what it means to be a man and truly show you what it means to be a woman. And I just have to wonder what it would do for our hearts and our minds and our souls if we began to value what God values, look for what God looks for, and nurture what God nurtures. God, thank you so much for Eagle Brook Church. I pray, Lord, that you would help us truly know what it means to be a man of God and a woman of God. May we take our cues from you before we take our cues from culture. Lord, I pray that we would value what you value, that we would look for what you look for, and that you would help us begin to nurture the qualities that truly make us beautiful people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Join us next week for week two. Hope you have a phenomenal week. See you.